So I'm going to introduce Sam King. Sam, you may know, is our, our immediate past president of HIMSS, of our chapter. And he's also um, involved in a number of organizations. He has a, or he's a senior executive consulting and teaching experience in healthcare IT, healthcare finance, project management, analytics, business intelligence. You really have business intelligence experience, Sam? He is wonderful. You know, HIMSS as a chapter really grew during his leadership, and we as a team have much more program management uh, tactics and strategies employed in how we conduct business, much due to Sam. So I thank him for that. Uh, he is an industry fellow. Yeah, thank you for what you've done for HIMSS. Um, he serves as secretary uh, for 2013 of HFMA, which is the Health Finance Management, uh, in Southern California. He serves on the HFMA National Board of Examiners and is recipient this year of the National Hymns Chapter Leader of, or the Chapter Leader of the Year Award. So Sam, come on up. John, thank you so much for the kind words. Thank you, guys. Uh, we have a great chapter. We have great leadership, great membership. So thank you for coming. Thank you for sticking with us. Okay. And uh, for that, we have a treat for you today. Uh, as you can see, the title is called Career Workshop. So this is for newcomers, students, emerging professionals, as well as those who want to get advice those who want to talk to the distinguished panelists about what they can do to advance their career. Um, fortunately and uh, coincidentally, I know all these panel members very well. Um, I'm not going to read through the uh, bios. Bios are available on the website. You've probably seen them. Um, you know those are distinct. Uh, panelists here, and they have done everything and anything possible, okay? Just briefly, to my immediate left is Leah Verizon, who uh, we work together at UCLA. He, she is the Director of Executive Education for Healthcare Policy and Management, uh, someone who, has extreme, who is extremely talented. I'm not seeing someone who is so talented with PhD, MBA, MPH, I don't know if you're going to get an MD. Is that your plan, too? My but second plan. Second plan, so something like that, right? Very soon. Um, I have a pleasure working with her and uh, for her in many ways. Um, I have a pleasure knowing her. Um, next to Leah is uh, Clark Kigari, um, our incoming chapter president starting July 1st. Now, he traveled all the way from San Diego, uh, so it takes him a little bit longer to get here. Uh, well, worth well worth it. That's what I was going to say. Thank you, Clark. <laughs> Clark has many, many years of uh, senior executive experience. Best of all, most suitable for this workshop is he's always looking out for students, for someone who's seeking assistance, seeking help. I cannot remember how many times I took my whole class to scripts where Clark secretly opened a little door in the server room, let us see what's behind that. It was just my blowing in, uh, at the scripts facility in San Diego uh, when I have a class there. So thank you very much, Clark. Next Clark left is Sunny. Sunny has been a uh, hymns a chapter uh, veteran for many years. He has done many, many uh, fascinating work, especially in entrepreneurial and the embryonic spaces. Uh, so you will share, he will share with you many, many things he's done and what works and what may not work. Uh, so that's amazing. Last but not least, Mr. Jim Brady from my home state of Aloha State. <laughs> Aloha! We're fortunate to have Jim this is a person you'll be amazed to find out. He has every single initials on faith of earth. And I'm not kidding at all. Probably 40, 50, you know, um, all the certification he has, all the skills sets he has. So you are here for a treat along with the rest of the panel. Additionally, 
Jim is someone I look up to say, Jim, how can we do something better? He say, well, let's start with this. So the person who has creativity, innovation, everything. So very lucky to have Jim. Jim, welcome to a broken California state from Aloha state. So. Anyway, with, with that in mind, um, here's what we're going to happen. Each panelist will start their introduction, uh, how they wanted to introduce you, their perspective, um, up to 10 minutes, somewhere 5 to 10 minutes. Then we're going to have structured questions that I will ask some of the questions along um, with what they are doing, and um, they can discuss among panelists and among, uh, in between moderates and, and, and panelists. Then we have a substantial amount of time open up to the audience uh, to share and to discuss. So we want to make sure this is a round table type of uh, discussion. Okay, so be prepared. If you don't, if you're shy, you can tweet it. If you can hint on the, the secret notes, I will take it to anything you want. We're going to uh, discuss. All right. So thank you. Without further ado, Leah, that's your thing. Thank you. Thank you. So um, thanks, Sam. Um, like I said, we're going to we're going to make this hopefully a little bit more interactive. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time up here. But one of the things I wanted to um, sort of correct, or my perspective is that despite there being actual students in the room who, of course, are looking for educational um, guidance as well as career guidance, I actually see every single one of you as a student, um, as a lifelong learner. That's my approach to executive education. So this is not a talk for, hey, you're a student and you want a job. This is very much, given everything we've heard over the last uh, few hours, you can understand that this is a constant moving target. And so I want you to take on the um, persona of, I constantly need to learn. And that's really my approach to this. Um, because I'm at UCLA, because I'm a professor, and because it's just in my nature, I like to read a lot. I like to look at statistics a lot. And so therefore, I couldn't help but at least throw up a couple of um, numbers for you to see. So first of all, uh, there's been a survey done by BW Research Partnerships just a, a year and a half ago that shows that more than 50% of all healthcare employers are finding it hard to find health IT workers. Okay, Everybody's talking about the recession and job growth, and as you all know, this is not an area of bad employment. There is more than enough opportunity, and the key here is, as you can see by my title, it's professionals who are trained with IT and health. It's contextual as well as skill-based. So healthcare employers are looking for health IT professionals and they're having a lot of trouble finding them. About a quarter of all California employers have indicated they are outsourcing health IT work and that is because they can't find enough workers. They would prefer to keep it, but they're having to outsource. Healthcare workers that require at least some minimal HIT job functions are expected to grow at a much faster rate, seven to nine percent in the next 12 months. Okay, so while the rest of the economy is a bit stagnant, there is a lot of growth here. So whether in my world, whether I see people who are non-healthcare IT professionals or others like lawyers and uh, other finance folks, have decided to actually move into the healthcare world because they are finding that our industry provides opportunity for excitement, for growth, for opportunities that they're not seeing in their other areas. And one of the latest things I saw was that the most successful employees in medical informatics are not trained in one or the other, but they actually have to be trained in both information sciences and healthcare to actually go up the ladder. Um, that they need that. So a little twist on the title here is that we also need healthcare trained IT professionals. If you've been watching the news, you know that people still don't understand healthcare reform in general. So 50% of Americans are still unclear as to whether their state is offering a health insurance exchange. So we sit here in rarefied air. We talk about the things we know and we're all in here listening as fast as we can to people like Penny and others talk about you know, what's going on in our state. But if you spend any time with relatives, friends, or traveling, you understand that most people don't understand 
any of our language, what we're talking about, and what we assume other people understand, they are way, way, way behind us. So half of Americans don't understand health insurance exchanges and even know if they have that option. 80% of Americans currently don't know whether Medicaid is expanding to cover the poor or not. Okay, Healthcare management employment, again, is expected to grow 116%. So we need to take you as professionals, if you're not currently well absorbed into the context of what is healthcare reform, what is the context of healthcare, and think about yourself as a healthcare professional, not just an IT skilled person. It has to be a combination of both. And that's where I see, as the director of executive education, a lot of opportunity. There's piles of people who understand healthcare as clinicians and they don't get IT and vice versa. So we have to somehow bring them together. As you can see, and you'll have access to these slides, that there are certain skill sets that are being talked about important for a health IT professional. But what I did is I circled some of the ones that I want you to notice. I was trained in liberal arts before I ever went on to graduate school, and I always felt a bit, it was fun, but what am I gonna do with my life? Look at what the health IT market is demanding of people who are supposedly very skilled. First of all, interpersonal communication. This is not hide in your cube, hide behind a computer and code. This is people who succeed must be good at communicating. The next two are creative problem solving and multitasking creativity and attention to detail. So to me, these numbers emphasize the fact that it's not just skills, it's also being able to be connected, network, relationships, problem solving, and being open. We t use the word innovation a lot in healthcare, but I think it's a bit overused. Really what we're talking about is people who see opportunities in new ways because of connecting. Right? My 10-year-old daughter yesterday was inviting someone over, and I said, why don't you just pick up the phone? She's 10. Why don't you just pick up the phone instead of text? And she said, oh, calling is so awkward. She's 10. And I'm having to beg her to call another 10-year-old and invite her over rather than text, but she already feels like it's awkward. So we have to get back to the people skills when our employers are begging for it because that's how work is actually getting done. So really quickly, there are, in my opinion, and UCLA and our Department of Health Policy and Management is actually working on a short series of health IT courses. So it's not coming back for a degree. Yes, it's nice to get another degree, but ultimately it's not the degrees that are being sought. It's the skills and the context uh, that are being sought. So I sort of see three categories of um, what's your role in a healthcare organization. Yes, we need hardware and software knowledge. Absolutely, analysts are important and they have to be able to push the buttons. But if you're wanting to then lift your career up a, a notch, I would say then we have to look at it from information systems. Now many of you know this, but it's again, weigh the two buckets of information. That is the skills, married with the context and the ability to connect the dots. So in this case, now all of a sudden we see information systems being about problem solving and analytics. Not again, just the skills based. And finally, what we're really seeing is when people get up that ladder and they're really coming back as a lifetime learner, they're asking themselves, can I make decisions on the information that your data systems are spitting out at me? Can I lead people you know, um, Penny, who was just up here talking, was so impressive. She talked about the fact that she knows how to convene people, and that's how stuff gets done. And that's a really important part. You have to know your stuff, but then what do you do with it? How do you add it together? Just a quick qu quote here. Health IT has changed the skill sets that healthcare employers are actually requiring from people like you. Yes, the technical skills are expected. They're expected, but they're not necessarily enough to make you succeed if you don't know how to do the communication and creativity. My last slide basically just says, think, 
you know, from my opinion and all the people I talk to, and I'm sure these gentlemen here are going to mention this as well, it's no longer just about following a certain career path and therefore you get the job. In fact, most of our 23 to 26 year olds are much more technologically proficient than any of us, right, by far. But they always ask me, how do I get that job? And I always say, it's not just because you've come back to school to get a master's degree. It's so much more than that. So think first of all about your knowledge set. Yes, if you actually need the technical skills, there are single courses out there. And in fact, there's fabulous um, large open source courses on the, these are massive online open courses, MOOCs. You can take these any place, any time for free. That's what gives you the technical skills and the knowledge. And then, yeah, step it up, you can get certified. There are certificate in health IT courses. There are certificates in healthcare leadership and management. If that's what you think is going to give you a leg up for your executive pathway, do it. Absolutely do it. But there are steps. Next, get a degree if you want. Of course, I'm going to welcome you with open arms if you come to UCLA um, and really want to amp up all of your skills. So not just the IT, but strategy, finance, marketing, how do you put it together and really break through that ceiling? And then finally, the reason why you're here is about actually making those connections. I'm sure everybody like me has been checking their email and doing some other things, but most importantly, you showed up. And you didn't just sit at home and watch it on a webinar or sit behind in a desk saying, I don't have time. It's when people tell me in strategy, I don't have time for strategy. You have to make time for networking. You have to make time for this. And that actually, I, I chose this little clip art, which I don't usually do, but I loved it because you see the little kid. I get more information from my kids about what I should know and put on my iPad than I actually will from any of you, sorry. But they're really informative. And I think of all fields, it's our field, both health, population health, health care, medical care, but how we use our equipment is going to come not from a top-down approach, but from everybody. So to me, that picture actually is, is very um, um, insightful for what it needs to do to bring the groups together. So with that, I'll stop. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, first of all, for being here today. I couldn't agree with uh, Leo Moore. It's, uh, it takes a lot for folks to take time out of their day to come to these events, and we really appreciate it. Secondly, I was listening to your comments, and, and at so many points during her comments, I thought, that is so absolutely correct, and I'm not sure that everybody in our industry really understands it, particularly the one about being a healthcare professional that has some IT skills. You know, traditional IT shops have always been, they're sort of the IT gods, oftentimes under the stairs. Um, they're a little unusual to try and have a conversation with, but boy, do they know a lot of stuff. Right, And building that stuff, there was, um, not so many years ago, a perspective of come and bow to the wisdom and the knowledge that is the IT prowess in any organization, not just in healthcare, but finance and manufacturing and, and others. And it's not that way anymore. It has to be about healthcare and patient care and the relationship, and you just happen to have some IT skills. So, um, as Sam mentioned, Clark Kegley, I'm with Scripps Health down in San Diego. I'll talk a little bit about uh, what Scripps Health uh, is about. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Information Services. And someone asked me the other day, what really is that job about? <laughs> so I guess I'm technically a CIO with training wheels. Uh, <laughs> at, at my heart, at my core, I'm an operator. I love operations. I love really messed up, falling apart operations. Anybody remember the movie Doc Hollywood? <laughs> Michael J. Fox. Come on, I watched it twice. Okay, <laughs> remember that great little Porsche he had, that convertible. Do you remember what happens to the Porsche? Do you remember the mechanic? Basically, the Porsche gets run over by a semi. It's the second or third time in the movie that the thing gets destroyed. Right? It's in a box. It's literally in a box. And he's standing there next to the mechanic, and the mechanic's got his arms folded over his chest, and he's looking at it, and he's got this very, very sort of sour look on his face. And after a minute of a pause, he goes, I can fix that. And he does. He fixes the car. And I think from an operations perspective, for those that run IT shops, participate in healthcare IT today, and those that are interested in, in growing, 
that's something that you really need to understand and embrace is the operations. You need to know the operations at their very core in your organization. Three ways to Sunday, as my dad used to say, you need to become experts at it. If you don't have access to all of the operations in your organization, then what you need to do is you need to develop some friendships, uh, colleague relationships, even some mentorships. And none of us in this room are too old to have a mentor. I have a fantastic mentor, two of them actually, and, and I'm old, I'm a grandpa. Uh, and they're giving me great insights about how to continue to grow. And, and Leah said it very well, you have to continue to grow. If you stop growing, you get stale. And after a while, we know what happens with stale, right? It stinks. So a little bit about Scripps Health, just to tell you uh, where I work and what we're about. We're five acute care hospitals, 23 community-based clinics, under three separate brands that you see listed out there, a home health agency, very recently a hospice agency that if you've seen the papers, we've just brought into the organization, seven medical groups, four well-being centers, three urgent cares, partridge in a pear tree, who cares, right? So approximately 2.5 billion. Uh, as an organization, about 13,000 plus employees, uh, one of the largest employers in San Diego, and uh, 2,600 affiliated physicians, uh, 1,323 licensed beds across all of those campuses, and our IT shop is about 343 people. Most of those employees of the organization with a very tiny, tiny bit of consultants. So in San Diego, our corporate office is literally across the street from SAICs, and they're moving. Uh, anybody that's following SAIC knows that. And in our area is Qualcomm. So from an IT pro perspective, we are competing with organizations like that to try and attract the best and the brightest of technologists to our organizations, and it's very, very difficult to do that. Yes, you can embrace the mission, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second, and you can interview for the mission. But at the end of the day, a network administrator or a server admin or a developer has an opportunity to go to other industries and make more money. So you have to really figure out what it is you're going to do to attract that talent and compete with the likes of Qualcomm and others. And here's some of the things that uh, we have used at Scripps that have really proven successful. And all of these, on the, and this is the second to the last slide, thankfully. All of these things you really have to take and embrace those that work for you, modify them if you need to, throw them away, it won't bother me a bit. I think one of the most important things that we all should be doing is hire for talent, not for skills. Leah said it very well. You're expected to know the technology. That's a given. Most folks don't get those kinds of questions in the interviews when they come and talk to Scripps because we simply expect, like walking, breathing, talking, all of those basic functions, you already got that. But do you have talent? And talent really extends into the relationship building part. And relationship building leads to having a thoughtful business discussion, not a technology discussion, about what's impacting the organization, both from a clinical operations and a business operations perspective. And it's when you can take those brilliant technical minds and get them to be business folks in support of clinical operations that you've seen nirvana because then you're problem solving, and you're not doing it with any sort of technology, you're doing it with brain power. Dr. Kellogg this morning, uh, Dr. Kaiser this morning rather, um, used a quote that's very similar to one we use a lot at Scripps that I absolutely love. If you automate a bad process, you get an automated bad process. And we do that a lot in healthcare. And then try and figure out why it didn't work. And we usually don't find the answer because we're not willing to look at where we started in terms of solving the problem. So uh, second bullet point there I think just hits home. It's way more important to build relationships than it is about technology. Technology and healthcare, we all know how it works, right? On a good day, we're 15 to 20 years behind everybody else. All of our organizations are full of legacy apps. We use 20 to 35% of the functionality of those applications. And every time we have a new problem, we buy another system. Anybody's healthcare organization on the provider side not look like that on some level? Because if you do, the rest of us want to talk to you. <laughs> when I interview people, I always say to them, I can teach you the technology, I can't teach you to care. Leah talked a little bit about the mission. 
Okay? The mission is so important. That's where we come after some of those highly skilled people that we have to compete for with Qualcomm and other organizations. Yeah, it's great to go into finance. It's great that you develop the ATM network that we all use when we walk up to our bank. But at the end of the day, have you really impacted people's lives in a positive way? Some would argue if I got money out of my ATM, you might have. But everything we do, and we drive this home, everything we do has a patient on the other end of it. And that's a pretty cool reason to get up and go to work in the morning, I think. And I've been in healthcare IT my entire career, and I, I can honestly say I've, on my seventh job at Scripps Health, no two days in 15 years have ever been alike, and I kind of dig that. And that's part of what we try to explain to people, particularly younger folks that have gotten their credentials, they've gotten their certifications and their degrees, and they're going, now what do I want to do? What's really interesting about the younger group of people that we're seeing is they want to make a difference. Well, if you want to make a difference, how about making a difference in people's lives relative to their health care versus just building the coolest piece of technology that's out there? Be aware of the textbooks. Textbook experts, and for a boy from Kentucky, that's really hard to say quickly. What is a textbook expert? That's somebody that has perhaps gotten a master's degree in computer science and can quote chapter and verse what the books say about computer science. I'm not discounting the degree because I know it's hard to get, but what do you really know? How can you apply it to healthcare? That's what's missing. That's part of that relationship piece that's so important. Again, at the end of uh, the day and connected to everything we do as a patient, so that's really important. What if it was your family member? What if it was your wife, husband, brother, sister, child, parent? At the end of that equation, wouldn't you want the best possible outcomes? And what are you going to do to ensure you achieve the best possible outcomes? What is acceptable failure? Had a manager one time that said to us, said to me, and I'm known in my organization for never losing it. No matter how bad the situation is, I'd rather calm the room down with a joke, not always good ones, get everybody to relax, because when they relax, they let their guard down, then you can begin to be business people and solve the problem. And this is one of the few examples where I almost lost it. We'd done a push, Microsoft Shop, we'd done a push, and it negatively impacted 11% of our fleet of PCs. And the manager overseeing that area said to me, well, 11% is a pretty good number. And I was shocked. And I said, based on whose metrics? Now, we have 13,000 PCs in our organization. 11% is a lot of PCs in surgery rooms, in radiology areas, in lab areas. What if it was your family member on the end of that? If you think about it, it really does hit home. Some basic operating principles, last slide, woohoo, that I use that I think are pretty effective uh, when dealing with technologists because technologists are a unique breed. Manage to the outcome, not the dollar or the date. I spend a lot of time in my organization saying, we thought we could deliver that on Jan January 1. We were wrong. You'll get it on March 1. Now, there's, you can take that so far, right? But so often in organizations, not just healthcare, we put together a high-level project plan. We think we've got the resources to do it, but we really don't. But we put them on the plan anyway. And then we extrapolate a timeline from that, and we say, we will be done here. And we miss it just about every time. Why not spend the time up front and manage to the absolute outcome that you're trying to achieve, and then work backwards from there? And say, here's when we can do it. Goes a long way in any organization, not just healthcare. The higher you go, the dumber you get. It's an absolutely true statement. I am an expert at nothing. And I came up in interfacing. Actually wrote one of the first set of HL7 parsing tools that ran on Windows 3.x. Was embedded in the Codemaster product. Royalty checks were a beautiful thing. But they wouldn't let me anywhere near the interface engine today. And they're right. You have to take on a different set of skills. If you elect to go into a leadership role, your job then becomes not, I'm great at something, but I need to move others to be great at many things. Everything's my fault. Let's move on. I go into a lot of meetings and referee P 
people that are a little freaked out about how they're going to look because something went wrong. My reference to the jokes that don't always work, I need the room to get over itself so that the logic, the thinking processes, the brain work comes out and people will solve the problem. The guarantee that I make to people is if it fails, I will go upstairs and say, I screwed this up and hope they invite me back tomorrow. And if it works, all of you get the credit. It's subtle, but it's important. And when it comes time to do it, you have to do it. And you don't have to advertise it either, trust me. People will talk about it and they'll know that it's happening. We can disagree, but without being disagreeable. Why would you ever want to argue when you're both trying to achieve the same outcome, which is patient care? It's okay to disagree, it's okay to debate. When the decision is made, I expect everybody to support it publicly and privately. Professional people aren't bothered by that. They'll subscribe to that, probably already do. Everyone's job is harder than you think. One of the most important jobs in our hospitals, on our campuses, are the folks that maintain the lawns. Because a new family that's moved to San Diego driving by La Jolla Hospital, if there were a bunch of weeds knee high on the lawns, they'd probably keep driving. Everybody's job is harder than you think and more important than you think. Every role matters and is critical to our success. Think puzzle. Puzzle's not done until all the pieces are in place. Everyone's got to do it. I'm from Kentucky. I'm really from Kentucky. You have to speak slowly and use small words. IT folks learn a lot. I love folks that use $12 words in the wrong, con wrong context. It's a little bit funny. If you just break it down because you are explaining things to non-technologists, speak slowly, clearly, get your message delivered, and then shut up and let them respond to it. Great saying that one of our hospital administrators uses that I think is terrific, wait for the sigh. That applies to physicians quite a bit. What do physicians do? Physicians will get in your face because they go at 100 miles an hour all the time, they have to. When they communicate what their problem is, take it like a man or a woman. Wait for the sigh and then ask your question. Lastly, analyze the data and then make a decision and if more data comes to light and your decision needs to change, change your decision and just say that. We all know people, perhaps work with people, that for whatever reason lock themselves into a specific decision and then think, I can't ever go back and change that decision because I'm going to look bad. Well, you know it's going to blow up in your face and then people will ask you, people that you would rather not have, have asked you, why didn't you make a different decision? Be proactive and people will come to respect that you're willing to do the right thing, manage the outcome, not the dollar of the day. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Boy, that's a tough act to follow. Mm -hmm. I think we should offer course credit for that, both of those sessions. <laughs> wow. No, I was looking at you guys and, you know, it, it's almost spellbinding. There's so many nuggets of truths, truisms in almost every bullet point. It's almost like we should, you know, spend several hours here and we could probably have questions and go on for ad infinitum. So my name is Jim Brady. Um, I'm very active with HIMSS at a national level with the Career Services Task Force. We, tr we sit around and try to figure out what is it that, you know, all 50,000 members, you know, really need to enhance their career. And really, as um, I believe that Leah said, you know, your career is really something it's, you're, you're working on all the time, so it, isn't, it definitely isn't, this, is, this session is not just for the emerging professionals or those that are new to healthcare. Um, I'm very, I've been very active for the last couple of years with the uh, Southern California HIMSS chapter in what we call the Academic Alliance. Any Academic Alliance folks out there? Give it a shout. Yeah, so there, um, um, I have a slide for, for the work that they're doing, but we really do try to offer internships, scholarships, mentorships, and just, uh, just a way to, uh, you know, how do you get started? How do you get that elusive health IT job? So there's a lot, you know, the jobs are out there as we've heard a little bit about it, but you know, there, it isn't necessarily just the easiest thing. If it was really easy, everybody would have the job, so. Um, and also as uh, during, when, I, when I'm not working for HIMSS, <laughs> then I do have a day job. I'm the chief information security officer and 
uh, uh, IT director at um, a, a small hospital called Hawaii Health Systems. Yeah, the weather's kind of rough out there, so. Um, uh, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's the fourth largest public uh, hospital system in the United States. Got about 14 hospitals, 1,200 beds, 4,000 employees. I don't have all the facts like Clark did, but, but you know, it's, it's definitely big enough. Um, we don't have quite the budget of scripts, um, but, uh, and then it is a state agency, which is phenomenally interesting working in the public, uh, working in a state government agency. It's totally uh, different from my last uh, position, which was at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Um, so, you know, uh, as I'll share in a slide, a lot of people don't actually look for the goal, uh, for the jobs that are actually, we have jobs that are posted, uh, and we might get six applicants for six positions. You know, and, and uh, so one of the key things is you gotta be smart in how you, in how you actually look for your position, and, and so um, let me go over a couple of things real quick here. So uh, one interesting thing is that uh, definitely the country knows that we need to do something about health care. So there's supposedly 50,000 jobs out there. People are saying, well, you know, where are they? Especially those that, are in the, that took the HIT program, the training. Uh, but you know, one of the major problems that uh, we, we have seen is that from the training to actually uh, getting the employers, the providers, many providers don't even know that there's a HIT program. And I actually had one CIO. He's the CIO of uh, Yale uh, Health System, which has Yale University Medical School. He actually said, hey, you know, um, I didn't even know about this. We were doing like a, an emerging professionals through HIMSS uh, webinar, and so we invited him to speak. And he said, well, you know, why don't you guys just come, get a group together, you know, like three or four or five, and then make an appointment with the local CIO and sit down and say, hey, you know, we want to let you guys know about the, the HIT program and that there's a group of people that are actually trained on uh, workflow development and things like that. Because, you know, the industry, they're not, they don't know, uh, they might know the word ONC, but they don't necessarily know all the programs. And the universities and colleges, they're uh, equally challenged. There's actually a, a university program that the government sponsored. So, so anyway, I listed a number of things here, and there's definitely a gap in... Um, you know, getting from the jobs are out there to, you know, you're a candidate, you really want to get started. So what, I'm, what I'd like to do with this, with my five minutes or six minutes, is just kind of give you some practical nuggets that you can, uh, you know, possibly take one or two and, and add that to your career track. Um, so, uh, first, so I'm going to share three things. First, um, it is important uh, that you understand uh, just what the healthcare industry is all about. There are, there's different tracks out there. So there's, you can be a consultant, you can be a vendor, you can work for a provider. And although you can jump from one to the other, uh, because of the competition and because of the amount of knowledge and skill and then all the soft skills, typically you're gonna find more success if you kind of pick one and try to be a, a pro at it. Now there, there are places where you can start in one and then you can kind of jump over. Typically, if you make a jump from one to the other, usually you have to jump at a minimum even, or sometimes you gotta go down. So if you're not wanting a, a drop in pay or something, or a, a position change, you might wanna just consider, you know, what are you good at, um, you know, and make that, as Clark was talking about, take a planning, a strategic approach to your career, and, you know, and decide, you know, what is it, where do I feel like I should go, and map it out, think about it a little bit, and you'll actually have more success. Um, go to the next slide. So a second key point, um, and I learned this out, um, uh, I had a job change a couple of years ago, and I, you know, and, and much of what's in the, in the slide deck that I've prepared is really from you guys, from uh, executive search firm people, contingency recruiters, hymns, mentors, you know, people that, you know, sat down and said, Jim, you know, you really need to change this, or if you want to be successful, you want to be hired, then you need to do this, that, and the other. Because really, I've, I, I've been working for many, many, many years, and I thought, you know, what's to know about career search? I mean, you know, I know everything there is. Just like I thought when I married my wife, like, I know everything about marriage. I mean, what is it that I don't already know about marriage? And then I've been learning, of, uh, I've been married now for 29 years, and every year I realize I don't know anything about marriage. So it's amazing how people don't really think that there's a science to managing your career. So talk to some people, and there's several things that you can do, but there's a lot of things out there that can really shed light into you, because uh, a job is a, little, a bit like a relationship. I mean, Clark's been at, um, at that scripts for quite a while. Um, although you're not only going to work for that one person 
till death do you part, or that one organization till death do you part. Uh, it also is, it's very relationship oriented as you move uh, up, you know, in your career path. And, you know, people want to be able to trust you. They want to be able to know you. And so that, re that soft skill, that making that connection and, and not necessarily leaving the next year or the year after, not, not even knowing why you applied. I mean, you had a cool title that maybe it's in a really nice place like Hawaii. Wow, like who would not want to work in Hawaii? Well, there's actually a number of things that would probably make if I told you guys, you would not necessarily say, well, you know, uh, it's good for Jim, but I, I don't think, I don't know if I want to do that. So it's a great place to vacation, but, you know, there are some challenges. So you got to like, you know, I, my wife is from Hawaii, so I have a bunch of relatives, so cousins and stuff over there. So it's, it, was, it was a good transition for me two years ago. Um, so one of the key things I'd like to say is I had um, a mentor uh, told me, you know, two things you need to consider when you're making a career switch. Number one is really look for a great organization and then look for an outstanding, awesome manager because you're going to have to work with that person. And quite frankly, there's a lot of bad managers out there and there's a lot of really bad organizations. I mean, I've worked for some organizations and it is like a nightmare on Elm Street. I mean, it looked like it was perfect and <laughs> everything was wonderful. And then it's like the definition of dysfunctionality is beyond comprehension. So you got to go past the cover. Uh, and um, so if, for this slide, I think I'd just like to leave you guys with that is um, do your homework. Um, yeah, and, uh, uh, and be strategic in your approach. And those, the note about the 80%, uh, one, of the, one of the best things you, you can do is to just get into the organization that you feel like is a good organization. And you know, before you know it, if you're looking for that health IT job, but you know, I'm not saying you should come in as a, as a help desk person or something else, but you don't necessarily have to come in with the ultimate uh, position. Once you're in an organization, they get to know you. My experience, most of the jobs, they, we tell the people in our organization about it, we'll hire from within first, and then if we can't find somebody, uh, you know, maybe the CEO or somebody way up at the top, you know, they do a national search, but for the most part, they pick, you, you do your picking and choosing from the internal candidates. Uh, and you don't, uh, I, you know, typically if you go, you're brand new into trying to apply for a position, if, you know, they're very hard, they want you to have all the experience, they want you to have the certification, you're, and, you know, so you're intimidated thinking, well, I, I, I just got out of the HIT training and, I, and I'm not EPIC certified, but how can you get EPIC certified if you don't get hired by a hospital that'll train you? Because you can't, like, go out and get a book on EPIC certification, or can you? I don't know. So, uh, but, you know, really, you can, that is the best place to get a job that you do not have formal training, but because they know you and they can kind of cover for you, you can make that transition. Okay, um, a, key, a key thing, and I know we've talked a little bit about networking, but a key uh, component of networking that I think is really important that I learned recently, I thought I knew it all, but apparently I don't, uh, was that networking isn't just about schmoozing with the person that might be your boss one day or might you know be able to hire you, but it's really about um, finding people that can tell you about the organization. Is that a place that you really want to work at? Is that the, is, are you looking for retirement or long term or, you know, is it a good culture or is it, you know, so networking actually can get you to the place where you can investigate the organization and it can really show, and while you network, it can also give you insight about yourself because people will begin to, you know, speak into your life. So it's some really great things about it. And of course, um, HIMSS is what better place to do that than at HIMSS because we have pretty much, uh, you know, all the health systems and health organizations, you know, coming and chances are somebody knows somebody and it's really not that you would need to get that somebody that's the person that might be the hiring manager, but somebody that can actually, you know, give you that second reference and maybe get your resume up a little bit higher up on the stack. Um, and so what I did is I just, this uh, kind of my, my last slide is I just put a few, uh, I don't know, tips or things that I've learned. I, and so I wanted to share a couple of them. One is, um, I mentioned before, you don't necessarily have to start at the top. So pick a job that you think you can smoke. You can do really good. Not, not that kind of smoke because it's a healthcare conference. But, you know, two, one of the things that I made a mistake on is I was trying to, you know, I always like, I'm a type A, so I'm always trying to go for five positions above, you know, like, President of the United States. You know, you don't want to apply for that job <laughs> unless you, you know, first went to law school or something, and then you know, 
be a congressman or something, do something. So oftentimes we fail because we just, or we don't get any interviews or we don't get success because we simply are trying for a job that looks really good, but you know what? You don't need to start there. Just start, just get in the organization, start, and time will fly by before you know it. You'll be having a great time and boom, you'll, you'll be offered that career move up forward. Um, uh, 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 probably a good, good, another good point is to, there's a number of criteria that you need to look at when you're making a decision. Uh, location, pay, is it, um, you know, is it a good organization, um, benefits, you know, so really uh, you, it's typical that you can't get all of your top 10, but maybe you can maybe get your top three. So, but it, uh, many people never make a list, so they don't even know what their top three is. So you got to get prepared, uh, you know, like I said earlier, get strategic. Um, although you can apply for every single job that comes in through indeed.com that you have alerts out for, you know, you might want to just focus on a, do some research, you know, pick 10 or five or something and just really dig into that organization, get, get to know the, the people that are there through LinkedIn. You know, you can, this, you can, it's amazing how much you can develop relationships and find out about an organization. Um, and then another really important thing and I'll end with this is, uh, trying to get into the health IT field uh, without that prior training, one of the things that you can leverage is your transferable skills. I think Clark mentioned it, that there's, that usually when we're, when I'm looking for like to hire somebody, we usually make it like, you know, they need the following 500 things. It's the wish list. It might intimidate the candidate, but you know, we know that we're never gonna get somebody like that. But you know, we're, we're looking for, basic skill sets that really come from any industry. And matter of fact, there's a trend in healthcare now where there, there's a lot of hiring coming in from manufacturing and finance because uh, organizations are now implementing EHRs and they want to become lean, they want, you know, they want process improvement. And so we're seeing people coming in from other industries. So you don't, just because you don't have a healthcare specific experience uh, position doesn't mean that you can't find a, 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 a position in the organization that will enable you to get to the position you would eventually like to get. So it might take one or two steps. So anyway, um, thank you very much, you guys. Um, hope you got some things out of this, and I will turn it over now to Sunny. After Leah, Clark, and Jim, I think I'll keep it real brief. They covered all of uh, what I have to say. What I'm going to talk about is on the on the ground stuff. You know, what's driving job creation in the physician marketplace? You know. Be, E2O Health works in the ambulatory physician side of things. We help implement EMR, host uh, electronic uh, health records. We provide telehealth consulting services. We are considered as a consultant and a vendor in the list of employers that Jim identified earlier. Um, so everyone knows ARA High Tech created newer opportunities uh, to, to, to the 2011 and 12. Uh, disbursement of meaningful use money increased the opportunities. There are a lot of jobs created last year than the year before. And in 2013, it's, it's estimated that 80% of ambulatory physicians have some kind of an EHR right now. Um, and, uh, and in 2013, what's going to happen is we're seeing a lot of vendor replacements. It's estimated that 17% of providers are replacing their current EHR. We're seeing that on the ground. Uh, we're, we're, we're helping providers replace their EHRs. That's creating jobs. Uh, several vendors are phasing out some of the EHR products, so uh, organizations are either transitioning from some old legacy product to a new product that's happening, and uh, some of the, uh, con there's consolidation of EHR vendors, so some products which uh, may not meet meaningful use stage two will no longer be in the market. So there's uh, consolidation and vendor replacement that's happening in the market, and then there's stage two that's driving the whole uh, uh, discussion right now. 2014 will, will be the first year for meaningful use stage two. Uh, providers are requested for 90 days since uh, stage two for in 2014. And then in stage two, uh, the stage two increases the thresholds for various measures, uh, which requires health information exchange connectivity, uh, various interfaces to cancer registries and other immunization registries, and patient portal. Uh, and there are some other key happenings in the industry, which is HIPAA privacy and security. There are audits that are happening in the medical practices for privacy and security uh, compliance. Uh, and then uh, meaningful use stage two is driving patient center medical homes, which means your PCP will actually become your primary point of care and they'll coordinate the care through patient portal and health information exchanges. So these changes are driving uh, these initiatives and there's reporting and analytics, several quality initiatives will require significant reporting and analytics. So 
And then there's ICD-10. Uh, organizations will need to migrate to I ICD-10 in 2014. So how does all these changes affect the job seeker you know, on the ground? What does it mean to me? Uh, the physician health IT marketplace is beginning to mature. So what does that mean? This requires job seekers to have some experience. You, you, you're, you know, you've just taken the HIT pro, uh, training, you want a job, it's, it's not that easy because you need some experience. Uh, as Jim said, a transferable skill. If you are new to health IT, you need to break into the industry. G a job seeker must have expertise in a transferable skill. So identify the skill that you're really good at and that you can transfer it into health IT. That's a very key thing, very important thing. Uh, so, uh, and it doesn't matter where you get in. And then, as Jim said, it's mostly the hiring is done internally. So there's, uh, there's that thing. Identify your transferable skills that you can um, apply in health IT. And there are significant uh, opportunities. Jim mentioned about incumbent workers. If you're already working in, in a healthcare setting, usually those, those members are given the first preference. The incumbent workers get the first opportunity. So that's, that's always there. Um, and then some areas to look forward to opportunities, HIPAA compliance, privacy and security work. We're doing a lot of that work right now. Uh, I see if you're in IT, you got all your Cisco certifications and all of that. Uh, if you can get your HIPAA certification, then you can actually start working at a company that does audit. So there's, there's opportunity there. Um, opportunities with health information exchanges. I guess in the health information exchange seminar this morning, I heard uh, the challenge for the health information exchanges was connecting with all the vendors. In Orange County, uh, the health information exchange is trying to connect to 50 different EHR vendors. So somebody has to develop interfaces with each of these vendors. So if you're a programmer and you know what to do and if you can, uh, can connect with these organizations that builds these interfaces, there's opportunities there. So th those are the kind of opportunities you'll see uh, in the health information exchange space. And quality reporting and health uh, uh, data analytics. Uh, meaningful Use Stage 2 is driving several initiatives like uh, patient center medical homes. You require in community clinics and federally qualified health centers have to report on HEDIS measures and, uh, and other quality measures. So you need to build reports and analytics. So if you, if you know about business intelligence reporting, there are opportunities out there. Uh, ideally, you know, uh, now with so many different EHRs, there are different reporting tools that are out there. If you work in other industries and if you want to you know, build those reports, you can. So there are opportunities right there. I'm seeing that uh, um, in the marketplace. And then Department of Pub Public Health and Ment you know, Behavioral Health Information Systems. I I've seen several opportunities in behavioral health and uh, uh, mental health right now. So there are, uh, there's funding out there. So I think those are areas you should look at if you're looking for uh, your new opportunities. And telehealth solutions. Uh, that's, uh, that's an emerging need for telehealth solutions. So we're working on some telehealth so, uh, projects right now. So we see those opportunities. ICD-10, uh, I think that's the discussion is getting uh, heated up now. Uh, organizations have to move on to ICD-10. Uh, they need, you know, organizations need help of converting, migrating charts from ICD-9 to ICD-10. So that's, that's uh, another area to look forward to for opportunities. How to prepare for these roles? I mean, I kind of kept it brief because I had a chance to see the other presentations before I made this one. So uh, I guess Leah and Jim and Clark covered what needs to be done. HIMSS conferences and certifications network in these events. Uh, if you're trying to enter health IT arena, get an internship in a healthcare organization. I think that's the first thing. Uh, I think that goes without saying. Get an internship. I think that's the, that's the beginning. And uh, that's the first step to break into healthcare IT. And then if you're an incumbent worker, specialize in the areas that are appropriate to your role by attending additional classes and additional training. Leah uh, summed it up saying that we have to be lifelong learning in healthcare. There's no, it's, it's just ongoing. I mean, there's no, never you can say I'm done, I've learned all, I, I know it all. So it's ongoing. I think if you're an incumbent worker, if you're already working, if you want to go to the next level, keep on uh, that learning hat. So that's all I had to say. Thank you all. Thank you so much.